This is the September 15th uh, meeting of the Federated- uh, Recording in progress. Thank you, recording is in progress. Uh, Federated Retirement and Health Care Trust Board meeting of September 15th. Uh, we will have a roll call vote. Uh, Trustee Chandra? Uh, present. Uh, Trustee Jennings? Present. Trustee Kelleher? Not yet present. Uh, Trustee Linder? Here. Trustee Avasti? Here. And I am here, uh, Chair Horowitz. Uh, oh, and Trustee uh, um, Elaine is Elaine, Trustee Orr, not here. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, hold on, I need some. A few ground rules for this meeting. We are continuing to meet under the auspices of AB 361. As such, all votes will be roll call votes. Uh, for discussion items, each trustee will have a turn to speak in roll call order, more than once desired, and the public will have an opportunity to speak on each item after trustees. Um, we will take the orders of the day uh, to be heard before closed session. Um, we will have a break at around the 10 o'clock hour and then another break uh, at one o'clock to accommodate the Civic Center broadcasting system. I'm asking board members to please stay on the Zoom uh, after the regular meeting ends so that we can conduct the various committee meetings, uh, which will need to approve their AB 361 uh, approvals. Um, I believe we... Do we need a vote for the orders of the day? Uh, we do need a vote to waive sunshine. Item right. 4B, there was uh, a late arriving attachment for item 4B, which is discussion and action of funding methods for the pension and OPEB plans with potential options for consideration for tier one. May I have a uh, motion to accept the orders of the day and to waive sunshine? So moved. I'll uh, second. Okay, was that uh, Trustee Linda as, as a move? Yes. And Trustee Chandra as a second. Any yeah. discussion? Any public Mr. comment? Mr. Yeah. Chairman, uh, uh, Trustee Kelleher is now with us. Okay, thank you. Trustee Kelleher, are you present? Yes, I apologize for being late. Not at all, sir. Uh, and we will go to you then on the roll call vote. How do you vote uh, on approval of the orders of the day and to wave sunshine? Do you vote aye, sir? Who are you asking? Uh, Trustee Kelleher. Aye. And Trustee Chandra. Aye. Uh, Trustee Jennings. Aye. Trustee Linder. Aye. Trustee Avasti. Aye. And I vote aye as well. So the motion passes. Excuse me, Chair. Yes. Did you read a correction to an effective date that was on the August agenda in orders of the day? Uh, no, I believe I did not. Um, there is a change in the effective date for item 1.2D on the August 18th agenda for Jesse C. Perez, Painter, Environmental Services Department, change in effective date from September 19th, 2022 to July 19th, 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a change in the orders of the day. Or do we do we need a vote on that particular item, or simply to announce it? Oh, you need a vote, Mr. Chairman. I see. So, uh, so motion. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee Kelleher. Do we have a second? Second. As a second from Trustee Linder. Any uh, discussion? Any public comment? Uh, Trustee uh, Chandra. Aye. Uh, Trustee Kelleher. Aye. The Vice Chair Jennings. Aye. Trustee Linder. Aye. Trustee Avasti. Aye. And I vote aye. It passes unanimously. Um, can we take uh, public comment before we go into closed session? As you wish, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. At this time, members of the public may comment on items not included on the agenda, provided that the matter is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. 
Members of the public who wish to provide comment at this time may do so by, quote, raising your hand, unquote, in the Zoom app, or if joining by telephone, by pressing star nine on your telephone keyboard. When addressing the board, press star six to mute or unmute, and please state your name for the record prior to providing your comments. Speakers will be limited to three minutes each. In addition, public comment on items listed on this agenda will be taken at the time that agenda item is discussed. Is there anyone here, members of the public, wishing to address the board? And I'm not seeing any raised hands. Okay, so we will close out the public comment section of the agenda and move to closed session.
Closed session, we can proceed with the agenda in open session. And the next item is the Mr. Chairman. Um, also, to note that there is no reportable action out of closed session. Thank you. There is no reportable action. Uh, we have the consent calendar. Do we have a motion to approve the consent calendar? So motioned. A motion from Trustee Keller. Do I hear a second? Second from second. Linder. Trustee Linder. Uh, any discussion? Any public comment? We'll have a roll call vote. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Keller? Aye. Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. Trustee Avasti? Aye. And I vote aye. It passes unanimously. Agenda item number two. Uh, death and survivorship notification. It will have a moment of silence for those who have served the city and who have passed. Thank you. We now move to agenda item number three, investments. We start with an oral update from CIO Palani. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do want to as always, start with some pro forma performance numbers. Um, as you all know, the market had a nasty fall Tuesday following the CPI report and one of the largest one day losses in recent times. Mm. Um, so fiscal year to date, uh, the numbers are uh, for the pension plan and this is through Tuesday. 
Um, of course, the market's uh, down 1% today. Um, but through Tuesday, the plan was up 1.53% uh, fiscal year to date, and healthcare trust was up 1.34%. Uh, these are, of course, unaudited estimates. Um, and today, uh, we are actually having our usual quarterly uh, performance update from Newberger and Makeda. And this will be for the quarter ending June 30th and for last fiscal year. Um, but before I turn this over to, to Casey and Laura, uh, I did want to share something with the board. Uh, later on, Laura will show that our three-year number, um, performance for the pension plan put us, puts us in the seventh percentile of our peers. Uh, so that's from the top, right? And the reason I say that is that when we, the current investment team took over managing the plan about four and a half years ago, actually, we were in the bottom 1% of our peers. Now, this is by no means an achievement of the investment team alone. Uh, there was significant input from the board because as you all know, the board is responsible for strategic asset allocation. And when I took over as CIO, uh, one of the things that I told the board was, you know, we first need to get beta right uh, before we get alpha, right? And what does that mean? I'm throwing out these terms here. Beta means, you know, what is our exposure to the market? What is our weight in growth assets, right? If we don't get beta right, we can get all the alpha in the world and it's not going to make a difference. We're still going to lag our peers and we're not going to do well. So it's most important to get our beta right, right? If we get our beta right and we don't get our alpha right, we will be okay. If we get our beta right and our alpha right, we will be exceptional. And I think that's what we, this team has demonstrated. And when I say this team, I mean the board, the investment team, consultants, and so on. Right, so so I think, uh, as the CEO of Makita apparently said recently, uh, you know there are no victory laps in investing. You know we cannot rest on our laurels. Uh, we have to keep doing well because we can lose it all tomorrow. Right, uh, but I think it is okay to once in a while pause, reflect, and say, okay, we've done a good job. It's not too bad. Right, and so so I just I asked Laura to actually run this exercise. Right, had we continued. Had we been 99th percentile in the last three years, had we continued to be in the bottom percentile, what would our assets have been? And because we moved from 99th percentile to 7th percentile, how much more have we actually added in value in dollar terms? So this is not relative to any benchmark. This is just absolute numbers, right? And so Laura did uh, actually run those numbers. And I'm going to now request her uh, to share her screen and just walk through that very briefly. Uh, Laura, if you will. Yes, happy to. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, so I actually, we, we ran these, uh, this information and I was actually surprised and, uh, and double and triple checked the numbers because it seemed like a, a large value add, but the dollar differential between the actual plan performance and the 99th percentile of the peer group when we add up that dollar differential over the last three years, it was an estimated $672 million in additional value um, versus if the plan had remained in the 99th percentile. And just as an aside, we did an internal training at Makita where we had to workshop a story about asset allocation or manager selection or something that, that happened with um, with our um, uh, investment advice. And so I, I went back and I actually hadn't done a postmortem on the time period that some of you recall and were involved with in early 2020 when the pandemic you know, first came to the US and the markets dropped um, a huge amount um, and went back and found, um, you know, you all met four or five times in emergency meetings. We re-ran re re asset allocation. Um, you know, that many times in, in such a short period, and, and you all made the, the bold decision that you'd been planning on um, to increase uh, U.S. equity in particular quite a bit after we had that market drawdown. And I think it's common for our clients and for institutional funds to, you know, be in sort of a low risk position and have a plan to increase the risk when there's a market drawdown. But most people don't actually act on that or do it quickly enough for it to make a difference. And, and you all did. So, 
um, kudos to the board and, and the investment team um, because this is a huge amount of added value for your beneficiaries. All right, thanks, thanks, Laura. Thank you for sharing that. And 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 by the way, your sister, your sister plan did as well, um, just as well. And so our assets at the end of June were 2.7 billion. Had we continued to be in the 99 percent, I would have been 2.1 billion. But enough said about the past. Uh, we have to focus on the future. And and look, our we have a fairly aggressive portfolio. And when I say aggressive, what does that mean, right? So. Veris has told us that our standard deviation, our risk tolerance is 12%, and we are at that limit of 12%, right? For a long time, we were at 10%, and we took advantage of the market, and we are now at 12%. And what that means is on days like Tuesday and days like today, we will lose value, right? And that's, that's just the nature of markets, which means that going forward, if we continue to be in a bear market, as a lot of people expect, we will lose value. But in the long run, I believe we are well positioned uh, to do well over the long run, to close the funding gap that we have. And we always have to be vigilant. We always have to think about the markets. We have to think about the things that impact the market, macro factors and so on. And we also have to be very good at manager selection. Who are those managers who will do better than the index? So we have to get beta right. We have to get alpha right. And so, uh, but I still did want to share that one thing because this is not so much for the board, but as but for our stakeholders, because I believe that our stakeholders sometimes don't appreciate the work that we do, and this is no fault of theirs. You know, it's sometimes it, it burden falls on me to to explain what we've done and how well we've done, and I just wanted to demonstrate that. So, and, Prabhu, yes, I have a quick question. Um, you say we have an aggressive portfolio. I, I don't really think we have an aggressive portfolio as much as a portfolio that is uh, focused on investing in illiquid assets because we do not need the liquidity of a day-to-day -day investment, like a, someone who like, needs to be able to sell an asset today. We're investing in assets that may have a longer time horizon, which matches up with our, uh, our liabilities. Is that true, or would you say it's... Oh, that's exactly right, Trusty Kelleher. And, and, and the reason I use the word aggressive is people should know that when the markets fall, you know, our beta is 0.7, right? About 0.7. Okay. And if the market falls 10%, our portfolio is going to fall 7%, right? And, and in fact, to, to your point, we are no more aggressive right now than the average plan, I believe, right? So we're about there. We used to be less than the average plan, and we may still be marginally less or about there. Right. So relatively speaking, compared to three, four, five years ago, we have taken on a little bit more risk. But you're exactly right. So it's 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 a very loaded term when I say aggressive, but I still want people to understand that this is not money that's hidden under a mattress, right? And our stakeholders will sometimes ask, okay, I mean, I've got this uh, in public meetings before. You've done so well. Why don't we just, you know, uh, cash out on this and keep this in cash, right? And we can do that. And we can have that. We can protect that 2.7 billion in assets that we have right now by, by you know, immediately converting it into liquid cash. But then we won't have any future growth, and we will not protect on, against inflation. So this is really meant to explain the portfolio stands in more layman's terms. But you are exactly right. We are not, we are not any more aggressive than the average plan out there. Thank you. That that's very comforting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so with that, uh, yeah, Balani, can I actually jump in and ask a question before we move to the next of item? Course. Um, well, uh, actually clarification and then another question. So uh, did you say over the past three years, the plan, the total AUM has gone from 1.2 billion to 2.7? Did I, I, was no, no, I, I what, what I said was, had we continued to be in the 99 percentile as of June 30th, our assets would have been 2.1 billion, uh, a little less than 2.1 billion, uh, just over 2 billion. And because okay. we moved from that to top decile, we are now at 2.7 billion, just for the okay, ter yeah. Terrific. Do you know uh, how much uh, the investment gains have contributed to our funded status? The person, uh, any way to know if, if the funded status has increased over that period of time? And if so, how much is attributed to investment returns? Yeah, no, I just, I don't know over the three year period. Uh, I mean, I'm okay. sure something that we can easily uh, get from Bill. And, and Bill may even 
uh, if he's if he's listening to this between now and his presentation might be <laughs> great that number uh, okay uh, but Thank but if, if we don't I, i'll make sure to get you that number and i'm happy okay. to share that with the board um so with that uh, if there are no more questions, I know we are on a tight schedule today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'm going to turn this over to Casey Boyer of Newburger. Yes, thank you. And as a longtime beta enthusiast, I appreciate your kind words for my favorite Greek letter. We like beta and we like alpha too. Okay, that's all I want to hear. Great, thank you. Um, as always, appreciate the time um, that we can spend with you all each quarter to give you the update on the private equity strategic partnership that we have with your team. Um, I'm going to take a second to share my screen. Okay, um, so today I'm here to present Q1 results. We actually have just recently reported on Q2, so I'll go through some of that dynamic as well um, in some of the performance that I'm talking through today. Um, but primarily, um, I'll be addressing Q1. That's the presentation we have today. So um, as we all know, 2021 was a fantastic year and the returns across the board, both in terms of realized uh, investments as well as unrealized investments did extremely well over that time period. Um, private equity, um, as you've noticed also <laughs> through the public markets, Q1 did come down slightly um, as, as did Q2. So for Q1, um, you'll see the net performance both for the legacy investments, were, which were the investments um, done by the program directly uh, before the Newberger Berman partnership, as well as the Newberger Berman uh, results and um, summary numbers in the middle column and the combined results. Um, on the right. So here for, um, for Q1, you'll see a net multiple of 1.9 times. Um, at Q4, that was 1.96. So as I mentioned, Q1 did come down slightly. Um, for Q2, the overall uh, performance came down about 4%. And that was very much in line with um, our overall uh, portfolio. So each quarter, we actually take a very in-depth and proactive approach to where we see valuations coming in. Um, given we have a large platform and we invest in lots of different private equity firms um, across all asset classes, we really try to look into um, kind of what the average uh, valuations are across the board. So just to give you an idea of how that played out across our platform, for Q2, buyout firms were down approximately 2.6% and venture firms were down approximately 6.9%. So close to close to 7% down for venture firms. Um, and that really did stay in line with how your program uh, performed during Q2. So, um, you know, one of, the, one of the benefits of 2021, and I said seeing increased realizations within the portfolio, um, you'll see here distributions of 38.5 million back to your program. Um, that number will go up um, for Q2. We made um, an almost 4 million additional distribution um, during that time period. Um, so I will continue on. Casey, can I interrupt you to ask a question here? Sure. So I just want to make sure I understood. Um, 
So this is as of March, this is Q1. You said so for Q2, the venture part of our portfolio performed similarly to Q1, down about 7%, or did I mishear that? So 7% was the overall Newberger platform of venture. Okay, correct. So, correct. Yeah. yeah, so that, that was not necessarily the Q4 to Q1 number for you all. That was as a very, as a larger uh, sample size, that's about what we saw venture firms down. Um, and then, you know, I didn't, I didn't specifically split out what venture was in your portfolio for Q2. I can definitely do that. But as a whole, your portfolio was down um, three to 4%. As a whole, so including? Including venture. And including buyout, so both Correct. together. Correct, the whole, the whole program. So was buyout up in Q2? Not necessarily. Um, there's less venture in our portfolio, as you know, um, just in terms okay. of the dollar number, there's just yeah. more buyout. So it's probably weighting the numbers a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so moving on, um, you'll remember this from each quarter, we benchmark the underlying fund investments for both legacy and Newberger uh, performance. Uh, so you'll see here, we've also added recently these arrows, which show compared to last quarter, which funds were down a benchmark and which were possibly up. So here you'll kind of see, um, unfortunately, some of them um, went down compared to last quarter. Um, and again, and, this is... And to clarify, down or up compared to last quarter is down or up compared to the universe of funds in that vintage year. Correct. Okay. So in the, in, the, um, in the far right, these two columns, that's the actual benchmark for that specific investment. And you'll notice here, we actually lay out first quartile, median, and third quartile. The performance of the investment is kind of the top line of the section. And so you can see where it falls in terms of the quartile, even if it's kind of on the higher end of the third quartile. So yes, it's a, it's a benchmark against um, the universe of peers within that vintage year and also benchmarked as closely as possible to the type of investment that it is. Thank you. Yep. Um, <clears throat> okay, so pages four and five are um, continue to be benchmarking. As I've mentioned before, um, the more recent vintages are a little bit too early to benchmark and those will come out um, as the funds develop more. Some of these have not called capital as of Q1. So very, very new investments at the moment. Um, moving on to page seven, um, this is more information on the actual exposures of the portfolio. So this is by the top line being investment type, second line geography, and third vintage year. Um, and you'll see both by committed, invested, and then as a whole um, for both Newberger and Legacy. Um, the, the real difference here on an investment type is simply the method of which the investments call capital. Co-investments are going to be invested immediately as that's capital that's going into one specific company. And then primaries here, you'll see as they draw capital over time, this invested pie chart will become much more similar to this committed pie chart. Um, for the other exposures, um, these are right in line with um, what we would expect in terms of geography and vintage year. We're, we obviously very actively work with the investment team in making sure our vintage year and investment pace 
of committing is on um, is on schedule and that we're all on board with how that is um, moving forward. Um, the next page is a performance analysis, the top section being the performance broken out by investment type. So primaries, secondaries, and co-investments. The bottom highlighting the net performance of the program versus uh, the benchmark. Um, so on the top, the primary, secondary, and co-investment um, returns look great. The co-investments have been really generating um, that strong early return, which we would expect um, that part of the portfolio to do. That's why we like to include, you know, 30 to 40 percent of our portfolios into co-investments and secondaries. And then primaries also, um, like I said, about 70 to 60 percent of the portfolio um, really to maintain that diversification and um, really help us put capital to work where in, in the parts of the market that we want to put capital to work. So all very important parts of the um, performance being driven here um, and all have been obviously distributing capital very nicely with co-investments over 50% um, distributed in terms of how much cost has gone into them. And then this bottom benchmarking, um, this is the net performance of your program um, quartiled against the peer benchmark using Burgess. And so you'll see here, we were happy to um, see the first quartiles on both an IRR and TVPI basis. And as, um, as earlier on the benchmarking, you can see what returns actually produce a first quartile, as well as median and third quartile. I'll mention, um, we're also very happy to see the first quartile returns. Since we are actively still putting capital into the ground, a lot of investments in years 21 and more, and you know, even 2020 haven't had a lot of time to develop. So having them being held at cost and still being able to produce this type of a return and, and uh, benchmark is um, uh, very positive from our standpoint. Casey, can I ask a question before we move on? Sure. Uh, so on two questions on secondaries. First, uh, so we have returned capital and now are getting capital in excess of our um, denominator. Correct. And then what what, what uh, investments represent the secondaries, like the mix, buyout versus venture or growth? What kind of it's, secondary? Yeah, it's, it's basically 100% um, buyout. We really okay. don't focus too much on, on co-investments, or sorry, secondaries in the venture world. So um, without going through each name specifically, I would assume it's 100% buyout. No, that's that's cool. Uh, and uh, do you? What is your opinion about uh, opportunities in secondaries coming up here in the next couple of quarters or in twenty twenty three in general? Yeah, we've already seen that develop. So um, over the last few years, a lot of deal flow has been more on the GP led side. So kind of looking at assets and whether that's a single asset or multiple assets, but really a GP led secondary type situation. Um, we have in the last quarter seen more traditional secondaries coming to market or at least LPs discussing with uh, secondary buyers that opportunity and what that might look like. Um, our secondary team actually just mentioned to the group on Monday that um, ever since Labor Day, they've seen a huge uptick already in deal flow. That's very common for the secondary market because a lot right. of LPs are trying to get by year end kind of things off their book if necessary. But um, there's, there's lots of conversations at the moment. We've already seen uptick in our deal flow. So I expect that to continue very heavily through the remainder of the year. And then we'll kind of see how see how that works in Q1, but 
Um, I think a lot of it will also be driven off of everyone's performance from Q2, which everyone's kind of getting in now. Um, and so we'll we'll see how how that either kind of makes it higher or or lower. But I, I expect over the next quarter to be very heavy. And then even in 2023, I think we all kind of feel that that's going to be much more part of the market. And that's why in our portfolios, we put co-investments and secondaries together as a bucket so we can be more opportunistic around those types of investments and making sure that we're <clears throat> comparing those two and, and making um, good decisions around that. Right. Thank you for the answer. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's that's actually the bulk of it. Um, the last few pages are really just the SOI line by line, which um, I won't go through and, and bore everyone with, but that's that's the main part of the uh, returns there and presentation. So I'll open it up to any other questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Are there any other questions from trustees? I do have another, but I'll let someone else go first and not hide the floor. Well, are there any other trustees? It may be the floor may be yours, Mr. Chandra. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Casey, are you? Uh, what What are um, the fund investment cycles looking like in the buyout world? I know that in the venture world they become compressed, and managers are coming back to market faster, and they deployed a lot of money uh, in the. 2017, 18, 19, 2020 vintages really fast. Uh, so I'm wondering how, how buyouts look. Yeah, it's a very similar story. Um, I would say, again, in the last three to four months, we've seen more extended timelines of funds that are actually in the market at the moment. So a lot of firms of course, there's a handful of buyout firms at the very top of the, you know, great returns. They've been in in the in the private equity world for a very long time. They're going to be able to raise very quickly. Um, we have started to see longer fundraising cycles expected from GPs in the buyout world, as well as if they had expected a close or a final close in Q4 many of them are now staying open until 2023, Q1 at least, to give LPs a little bit more time for their diligence and give LPs a, a little bit more leniency in terms of if they want to commit in 2022 or kind of save those commitments for 2023. So um, we haven't necessarily seen a shorter time of returning to market. I think it's a little too early for that, but I anticipate that coming. I think okay. once, I think kind of once um, 2023 rolls around, people are, buyout firms are going to be a little bit slower to market than they have in the past. I mean, they were coming at a long period would be two years in between a fundraise. They kept getting shorter and shorter, sometimes even a year after they closed their previous fund, they were already coming back to us. So we're hoping that settles down and gives us a little bit more time um, because frankly, there was a lot of funds over the last year, year and a half that um, you really had to be top quartile to be able to get into uh, LP cap in, into LP capital commitments because there was just so many funds in the market. You had to say no to a lot of them. Okay, and does that it was that it sounds like you think it'll slow down, but was that affecting sort of pacing and commitment plans uh, and specifically for San Jose was it, was that an issue or, or might that be I guess you don't think it'll be an issue in the future, but uh, I know it has been for LPs who are um, have a bigger venture portfolio than we do, which was just their whole deployment and pacing was kind of thrown up when their managers came back to market so much faster, came back faster and also from mm -hmm. bigger fund sizes, claiming valuations had gone up. So they needed more capital to maintain yeah. ownership percentage, which is, that's probably less of an issue in the buyout world. 
Yeah, we maintain that very closely. So in coordination with your investment staff, who we talk to about our annual investment pace and model portfolio, um, we show this to them weekly. We're very aware of how much we need to put to work each year. And it really, it does not go above that. So we just have to be more selective in the investments that we're picking um, and making sure that the capital we have to put to work that year is in, um, is in the best investment. So it, it hasn't affected, we're not bringing capital up to invest more in any year. We're, we're just staying on our pace. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Any other trustees? Any members of the public wish to ask a question or make a comment? All right, hearing none, I let's move forward to the next agenda item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I invite Laura to talk about 3C, uh, the ever attentive Mr. Hallmark heard our earlier exchange mm -hmm. on, uh, on the impact on funded status and uh, quickly whipped out his cal calculator and provided these numbers to us. So had we continued in the 99th percentile, our funded status based on market value would have been 43, 43%. And because we've done as well as we've done, our funded status was actually 58%. This is market value, of course, as of June 30th. And I think the more important number along with market value is actuarial value. And I'm sure he will talk about a lot about that later on in his presentation. Um, but I just wanted to circle back to trustee Chandra and the board on that. Yes, be, be careful what you wish for Mr. Polani. Yes. Uh, all right. So with that, I will invite uh, Ms. Weirich to talk about item 3C. Great, thank you. I will share my screen. So just as a quick review of what the market environment was like, um, this chart goes through July. So it even includes the, the uptick in July that we had where US equity markets were up almost 10%. But you can see here that 2022 through July, um, only the Bloomberg Commodity Index was up um, in positive territory. Everything else was negative. Um, tips held up relatively well since they are treasury inflation protected securities. Um, bonds were down quite a bit, um, not as much as equities as you would expect. Um, you know, we really had um, beginning of 2022, a risk off environment. So the riskiest assets like emerging markets were down the most. Um, luckily, we did have the recovery in July, but the markets have been challenged since then. We have um, some sort of differing um, signals in the market right now. You have, um, we have some slides in here that you're welcome to go through if you have time, but um, I'll just mention the yield curve is inverting, um, which tells us the bond market is um, thinking that we're going to head into recession. The labor market still looks quite strong. So that's sort of a, um, a positive and conflicts with that bond market information as well. Um, skipping ahead to your specific fund performance um, here, the total fund um, value as of the end of June was 2.9 billion, so hovering just below the 3 billion mark. You can see the current allocations were quite, quite close to policy targets. Um, and performance, while negative, was quite strong on a benchmark relative basis and a peer relative basis in terms of protecting on the downside. Um, the total fund for the second quarter of 2022 is down 6.7%, um, outperforming all benchmarks and ranking in the top 19% of the peer group. Um, for the year-to-date period, uh, the fund was down 9.5% through the end of June. Um, for the one-year period, a return of negative 4.4%. You can see that the peer median um, loss for the one year period was down 7.4%. So protected by about 3% or 300 basis points and ranked in the top quartile of the peer group. And then I know your CIO mentioned the three year returns, um, which uh, were an average of 8.6% per year and ranked in the top 7% of the peer group. If you take a look at the 10 year returns, they're still ranking in the, you know, the bottom uh, toward the very bottom of the peer group, but the recent strong returns over the past few years have brought up 
every other time period's um, peer relative rankings. Um, having um, private markets and, and hedge funds, um, which are risk mitigating in the portfolio or protective during the trailing one year uh, fiscal year period, you can see that uh, global equity was down quite a bit, you know, ranging from US equity down about 14% to um, global equity down 20%. Um, if we look at the next page here, you can see private markets. Private markets for the fiscal year period were up over 25%, so 25.6% positive. Um, the private equity was up 36.4%. Um, venture capital was slightly negative, but I wouldn't put too much stock in that given that um, returns are not yet meaningful um, on a time-weighted basis, given the, um, the newness of this portfolio in venture capital and the very small amount of assets there. It didn't have a big impact on the total fund. You see private debt with a time weighted return for the fiscal year of 25.1%, growth real estate at 26.3, and private real assets, if you recall, the Bloomberg Commodity Index being the only positive major asset class on the public markets, as you see that flow through to real assets, private real assets were up 30.4% for the one-year period. Emerging markets debt was really a standout in terms of publicly traded securities. Emerging markets debt was positive up 3.0% uh, relative to the benchmark, which was down over 20%. So you all have a um, fund, the Wellington Iguazu Fund in emerging market debt that is a long short um, emerging market debt manager. And so they don't um, capture all of that down beta um, when we do have a drawdown in the market. So uh, ranked in the first percentile of the peer group. Um, low beta was another bright spot, up 7.3% for this total bucket, um, while immunized cash flows were down slightly, <clears throat> market neutral strategies, um, where you have some uh, trend following, long volatility, sort of risk mitigating type hedge funds did their job, and were up 21.5% for the trailing one year period. In the other classification, um, TIPS and uh, core real estate were able to outweigh some negative returns from long-term government bonds and investment grade bonds. And so the other classification here was up 1% for the trailing one year period. So while growth was down, low beta and other were doing their jobs in terms of providing diversification and protection on the downside. Um, I will skip uh, ahead here just to look at sort of the risk adjusted returns as well, since they're very important. Um, you can see that um, for the one year on page 57, the three year on 58 and the five year on 59, all three of these time periods in the left column, you have a return that's above median for your plan. In the second column, in all three of these time periods, you have a standard deviation or volatility that's below the peer median, which is good. You wanna be less risky. Um, so you end up with a sharp ratio in the third column or a risk-adjusted return for the one, three, and five years that is top quartile. So not only were the returns strong, the risk um, was lower than peers, and so that resulted in strong risk-adjusted returns. Uh, I will wrap up there, um, but happy to take any questions. We obviously have a lot of other slides here that look at individual manager performance and slice and dice things in lots of different ways. Um. You're muted, Chair Horowitz. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder. And we appreciate all of the backup slides. I do review every single one of them. Uh, any questions from trustees? Any questions from the public? Okay, hearing none, we'll move forward to the next agenda item. But I think before we do that, I did promise a break at the 10 o'clock hour. So I think we will take five minutes at this point and reconvene at, um, I have 10.09, so reconvene at 10.14. So we are on board.
ready to resume. I hope all trustees are back from their five minute break. Yes, sir. All right, I wasn't, I wasn't gonna take attendance, but I appreciate that we are here. And uh, I believe Makita is having the next presentation item as well. Yes, that's right. Um, thank you. So here we have the health healthcare trust with a um, June 30 value of 345.8 million and current allocations quite close to policy. And looking at returns, um, to put these in context, if you recall, um, your healthcare trust tends to be a bit more, um, a bit riskier than the peer group. The expected return for the portfolio on an actuarial basis is quite close to that of the pension, um, but yet you can't um, invest in illiquid assets here given the liquidity situation of the fund. So um, here is a return that you see without those private markets and, um, and risk mitigating hedge funds with a one-year return down 10% for the fiscal year, which ranked um, the third quartile of the peer group. If you look at the three years, given that we did have a strong market environment for the past couple of years, you still see a top quartile return relative to peers um, of an average of 3.9% per year. Um, just like the other portfolio, growth was down quite a bit. Um, so, we're, so we're emerging markets. Um, uh, but if we look at some of the diversification that we are able to have in this portfolio, like core real estate, you see strong returns and commodities in particular. So I'm happy to take any questions on the healthcare trust, or um, it seems that I gave myself a presentation in my head on the private markets report instead of presenting it to you. So if it's all right with you, if I could toggle back to private markets, I'd like to do that. Uh, absolutely. Let's see if there are any qu quickly any questions on the healthcare trust. Are there any questions from trustees? And any questions from the public? All right, hearing none, let's uh, go back and hear the, uh, the uh, private markets report. Great, um, so here's the overall returns. And if you look on the left, you've got the type of private markets asset class and on the right, um, the internal rate of return, which is your return for each of these areas. And then on the far right column, the public market equivalent IRR. So because these- um, Laura, yeah. I'm sorry, I apologize to stop you. This is Roberto. Yeah. Um, and I apologize to the chair. We received a message from the, um, uh, I guess the Civic TV that actually transmit our meeting on TV. I wanted to know if there's any way that we can use a larger shot of the screen. I I'm not sure if we can or not, but I just wanted to pass that along. Does everyone yeah, see that larger? Yeah. Great. Yes. Hopefully that that will suffice what they were asking for. Thank you so much, and apologies for stopping you, Laura, interrupting. Yeah, no, no problem. These are obviously uh, different uh, views based on what you're looking at here. So, um, uh, thank you. So, on the far right, you can see the public market equivalent IRR, and so as you know, these partnerships you commit a certain amount of money, and then they call capital when they feel like it, when they have an investment to make, and then they distribute capital when they realize that investment. And so, the public market equivalent is a pretty um, complex calculation where we look at, imagine if you had put that same amount of money on that same day into a public market benchmark that corresponds to this asset class and distributed it on the same day and whatnot. Um, so if you take a look, um, the Newberger Berman IRR is quite strong relative to the public market equivalent. That That is a, um, a part, you know, those funds have been investing since 2017, which has been a strong market environment. And you'll see that the funds that your investment team has invested in private debt, real estate, real assets, and venture capital since that time have also been quite strong. But these IRRs take into account the full um, history of each program going back to the inception year for each one that you see on the left. Um, in terms of private debt, um, the current allocation is 3.3%, which is slightly above the 3% policy target. Um, if we take a look at the individual funds in the portfolio, as I mentioned, um, you know, funds that have been invested recently have done quite well. Um, if you look at the five funds that have been invested since 2017, starting with Aeromark down to Cross Ocean that have meaningful returns on your far right, four out of the five of those are significantly outperforming their benchmarks. Uh, taking a look at the real assets program, 
This is a program that's still building. Um, currently, there's a 1.8% allocation relative to a 3% policy target. There was one new investment during the quarter. Um, this is for the first quarter of 2022, given the lag. Pulse Street 2 is invested with a $6 million commitment. And taking a look at the individual funds here, you see some really outsized returns for Kimmeridge Energy 5, as you might expect, as I mentioned, you know, with commodities and energy being one of the strongest asset classes recently. Taking a look at the real estate program, currently there's an allocation of 3.6% relative to a 3% policy target. Um, if we look at the individual returns. This is a program where if you look on the left, there really weren't um, many investments made between in that in the 10 year period between 2007 and 2017. So there were a lot of, you know, strong vintages that, that we missed out on here. But if we do look at some of the more recent ones, um, taking a look on the far right um, at uh, DRA 10, um, DRA uh, 9, GEM 6, there's a lot of strong recent returns here as well. Venture capital is the newest um, private markets asset class. It has a 0.1% weighting relative to a 4% policy target and is still firmly in the J curve where you're committing more than you see in, in value here. Um, there were no new commitments during the first quarter of 2022. Um, and we currently only have three funds in the portfolio and they're too new to be meaningful in terms of performance. There are a lot of other slides towards the back of here, the, the back half of the book that look at the market environment, but in the interest of time, I won't go through those unless there are any questions. Great, thank you. And are there any questions from trustees? I had a quick one, but again, um, someone else can go first. <laughs> we look to your leadership on questioning uh, Trustee Chandra, so please proceed. Uh, I'm, I'm honored. Uh, so on your first slide, you had a, a vintage 2005 investment, uh, and I'm just curious, um, we, we, uh, w when will we be fully distributed? Um, when will we be out of that investment, do you know? The legacy private equity, so we don't have a, um, a, a section on the legacy private equity, mainly because you've only been investing with Newberger Berman for five years now. Um, so I would, I would have to look into that um, when that 2005. So, uh, Trustee know. Chandra, if, if I could jump in, this is Dinesh from the investment team. There is a small remaining position in the 2005 vintage fund. It's a uh, fund of funds. So there's um, some small legacy investments that are still being worked out. So I would expect in the next few years that that should be um, liquidated all the way down to zero. Okay, got it. And it's kind of like long tail stuff at this point. Uh... Uh, ju just some assets that they're trying to figure out how to sell that may not have uh, an apparent exit strategy. That's exactly right. Yeah, trying to maximize the value of very illiquid investments. Okay. And am I okay. mistaken? Is this the first time that the IRR of the legacy private equity exceeded the PME IRR? It seems to me we were norm we were have traditionally been below the PME. I would have to look back at, yeah, at the prior reports. Right, Trustee Avasti. I have a question on the uh, second quarter performance report. I do see that there are two funds uh, or investment managers uh, which are recommended on hold uh, because of underperformance. So my question is, uh, is there any kind of, uh, you know, benchmark on, on the underperformance uh, that you follow for, uh, for the recommendation for the portfolio? Sure, that's a good question. So um, back when there was a city auditor report, they recommended that there be an official watch list. Um, and so one of the um, criteria that was put in place for the watch list was that any manager that had underperformance relative to the benchmark would, uh, for the three or five year periods, would be placed on this watch list. So for Artisan in particular, um, they still have a 25th percentile rank compared to their peers since inception. So they've had a little bit of um, trouble recently relative to their benchmark for the three year period, but the long term total market cycle return is still quite strong. So we don't have any um, recommendations for changes there. Um, Cove Street has um, been a, perform you know, a, a performer, they've swung back and forth quite a bit. It's a really concentrated portfolio, so they're either doing really well or really poorly relative to their peers. And that's um, a manager that has been on, um, on the staff, on the internal investment team and Christina's radar for a long time, and we continue to evaluate. 
Thank you. Great. And any further questions from trustees? Or any questions from the public? Okay, hearing none, thank you. And we will proceed to the next agenda item. Thank you. So I believe we're up to uh, 4A, discussion and action on the Federated Disability Committee members. Uh, Roberto, would you like to introduce this item? I, I'll be happy to, Mr. Chair. Um, you may recall that uh, your board has had discussions on the uh, implementation of a Federated Disability Committee of uh, peer members of the board, uh, including a discussion the last couple of times on a recommended draft for a Federated Disability Committee charter. And at the last meeting, you board not only uh, accepted and, and approved the charter, but also the implementation of a disability committee. And so here with you this morning, I think the goal is to make sure that we fill that committee with uh, members of your board. So uh, the request here this morning is to make sure that we have um, three members that are willing to become uh, and form the first ever Federated Disability Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to, you know, if there are any questions or comments, I'm happy to address them. Well, let's, uh, th I believe we have made uh, uh, tentative assignments to the Disability Committee. And if we could Correct. throw those up for a review by the full board. And this will be the inaugural Disability Committee. So great prestige attaches to that. And uh, as an initial proposal, we have a Mark Linder as the chair and Julie Jennings and Mark Kelleher as uh, fellow members of the Disability Committee. Yeah, and just as a reminder, Mr. Chair, I think the three members actually volunteer, volunteered themselves in one of the discussions to become uh, part of the disability committee. So that's where uh, the three names are coming from. And of course, uh, Mark Linder was the, the lucky winner of uh, the recommendation to be the chair for the committee. Yes, and clearly we were uh, you know, trying to uh, distribute the, the chair responsibilities amongst the committees so we don't have one person serving as multiple chairs. Uh, Mark, uh, uh, Trustee Linder did uh, volunteer and acquiesce to, to chair this committee and they have an enormous amount of work, I believe, ahead of them. There's a bit of a backlog, I believe, in disability cases. Correct. So with that, I will open up uh, any discussion by trustees on the membership of the committee and then hopefully we will have a vote. So if any trustee would like to comment. Any comment from members of the public? Do I hear a motion to accept the proposed membership of the Disability Committee? Any Sorry, I was, I was on mute while I was trying to make a motion. <laughs> okay. Uh, to, to assemble this august group of individuals to be our first disability committee. Uh, very good. So we have a motion from Trustee Chandra. Do we have a second? I second. And that was Trustee Avasti. Yes. Any discussion? Any comment from the public? Hearing none, we'll have a roll call vote. Uh, Trustee Chandra. Aye. Uh, Trustee Keller. Aye. Vice Chair Jennings. Aye. Trustee Linder. Aye. And Trustee Avasti. Aye. And I vote aye as well. So the motion passes and we now have a fully staffed disability committee. Thank you all for serving. Um, yeah, thank you. And we will be in contact with uh, the committee members um, just to make sure that we understand what the responsibilities are and when we're gonna start 
considering the uh, scheduling uh, committee meetings and staff will be in attendance at all those meetings going forward as well. Per AB 361, will their first meeting need to be in person? Uh, the first meeting, you are correct, will have to be in person. Uh, we could just have a quick meeting just to adopt AB 361 so that we can have future meetings uh, remotely, at least for the time being, but you are correct on that, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. And then a, a simple, a quorum of two members would be suffice for that purpose. So, great. And uh, now moving forward to item 4B. Discussion and action on funding methods for the pension and OPEB plans with potential options for consideration uh, for tier one. And I believe uh, Bill Hallmark from Chiron has a presentation on this item. This is a continuation of our discussion at the last meeting where we were challenged to see if there were some changes we want, might make to amortization periods in order to uh, possibly improve the funded status of the plan. So with that introduction, Mr. Hallmark, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as uh, the chair indicated, you know, last month we had the extensive review and I apologize for how much detail we got into there. But we had, were challenged at the end of the meeting about uh, whether we could accelerate the, the funding of the federated plan and how to do that. So uh, for this meeting, we're going to briefly go over how we got where we are and, and what uh, initiated that uh, challenge. And then we'll look at uh, consideration of shorter amortization periods for tier one and how that affects how quickly we get funded and what the cost is of doing that. <coughs> so to start with, I think uh, this is the information that uh, fiduciary council was probably looking at when uh, he made the challenge. We've had this history going back of the increasing unfunded liability and just a detail note here, there was no valuation in 2008. So these charts show 2007 and the next bar is 2009. But this ever increasing unfunded liability and then on the funded status, uh, we started high and it's been declining and has not been recovering and is still below 60%. We talked last time that a big chunk of that uh, has to do with the declining interest rates and, and discount rate that we've used. And so I put that on the chart just so you can see that, that parallel. It, if we look at what has caused um, the unfunded liability over this period, the chart breaks it into three different uh, sections of that period. But the largest piece is has been the assumption changes, almost 860 million of our unfunded liability uh, comes from the assumption changes, mostly reductions in discount rate, but there were also significant changes in our mortality assumption and our refund assumption changes uh, early, up, early after the Great Recession hit. So in the 2010 to 2015 timeframe. And so you can see those as the large purple bars here. Since then, uh, we've had smaller decreases in the discount rate and just minor assumption changes. And that's kind of what we expect going forward. Uh, investment losses over this period were the second largest, not surprising since it includes the Great Recession, of about $700 million. I do wanna note, these are on the smooth actuarial basis. So uh, they do not include most of the 2021 gain or any of the 2022 loss. Um, so, you know, I think this would look much uh, better if we were looking at the market and going forward, we'll get uh, the benefit of the last few years of investment experience. So the other thing I wanted to point out on this chart is contributions. The contributions early on in this period were too low to to reduce the unfunded liability, and even before the Great Recession. And so 
uh, we've worked to increase those contribution rates. And you can see that in the period 2018 to 2021, contributions have actually worked to reduce the unfunded liability. So th that's been a significant change that the board has made. And if we look, uh, you can see that impact here. The gold diamonds on both charts are the, the federated plan. The left chart's comparing to national contribution rates from a national database of public plans and the right chart to California plans. And, and you can see we were in the middle of the pack and then increased the contribution rates fairly rapidly uh, and, and are among the highest. In the California chart, uh, the pattern is similar. I added in an aggregate with police and fire because most of the other plans in this combine their general members and police and fire members. So that's probably the, the more accurate comparison here, which puts San Jose among the top in California. Uh, the top of the bar, 95% of the plans are below the top of these bars. Going forward, uh, this is how we expect to pay it off. If all of our assumptions are met, we, this is the current schedule. The unfunded liability would uh, gradually decline till about 2040, 2041, it, it gets all paid off. Uh, the funded percentage would increase reaching about 100%. 99% in 2040, I think 100% in 2041. We showed these projections last time. They've been updated a little bit because we've gotten updated asset information. Um, but the bars are our current projection with the 2022 investment losses and the blue line shows what we were projecting in the last valuation. You can see that as a percentage of payroll, we're still expecting the city's contribution rate to, to slightly decline, but as a dollar amount, uh, it's expected to go up uh, gradually. Uh, the last valuation, we came up with a $209 million city contribution. We're currently projecting 211. Now, we haven't done all the analysis looking at the liabilities, so, so that's very much a preliminary number. So if we want to speed that up uh, to get to 100% faster or to improve our uh, funded ratio faster, the, uh, the best tool for that is to uh, reduce the amortization periods for Tier 1. Currently, uh, we are amortizing experience gains and losses. That includes the investment gains and losses after the five-year smoothing period and, and any other experience over 20 years. Uh, the general actuarial guideline is 15 to 20 years. Uh, assumption changes, the guideline is 15 to 25, and we're using 25 years. Benefit improvements uh, are the general guideline is five to 15 years. We're using 20 years. We really haven't addressed this because we haven't had any benefit, any material benefit improvements over the last um, 10, 15 years. But if we use shorter periods, that will uh, get us to 100% faster. It also uh, increases contribution volatility and increases the contribution amounts. I mean, basically, if we want to get there faster, we're going to have to contribute more. Here's the California survey comparing those amortization periods. And on experience gains and losses, you can see uh, about 13 of the 39 plans uh, use 15 years and about 12 use 20 like us. Uh, on uh, amortization, on assumption changes, I'm sorry, about 16 uh, of the plans use 20 years. Uh, we're one of three plans that uses 25. So we are at the long end of the, the spectrum, but very much within the reasonable range. And so if we want to 
but if we want to accelerate the funding, we could look at moving those uh, periods from uh, 25 to 20 on the assumption changes and from 20 to 15 on the experience gains and losses. Now, if you want to do that, there you want to consider how you transition from where we are now to that uh, faster amortization. And the simplest approach is to just do it for new amortization periods. So we don't change anything in the current schedule, uh, but anything new that comes up, uh, we amortize over the shorter period. That gets the future, any future losses are taken care of more quickly. It's not really going to have an effect on the current schedule. The other end of the spectrum would be to just uh, do it immediately and reduce all the current remaining periods by five years so that it's as if they were on the shorter amortization schedule from the beginning. It's going to increase the payments, but get us to 100% five years sooner. We could also just look at the pieces that currently have more than 15 or 20 years remaining and just reduce those. That will get us kind of somewhere in the middle. So um, we have three charts here to kind of show the impact and then a summary chart. The black line here and the blue line here are what it is if we make no change and the bars reflect if we make the change. So if we did the emerging option, you can see there's not really an impact. Uh, that's because it's really only going to affect future gains and losses and future assumption changes. There are no um, future assumption changes in our projections, and the gains and losses are just from the assets smoothing. So there's no real impact here. At the other end of the spectrum, an immediate option of reducing everything by five years, it really reduce, starts reducing the unfunded liability much more quickly. It gets us there five years sooner. The impact is it's going to immediately increase the city contribution by about $64 million next year. So, um, and, and it would stay high uh, for, for a while, but it would drop five years sooner than under the current plan. The in-between option uh, has an in-between effect. And uh, the immediate impact is about uh, 12 or 13 million uh, dollar increase to the city's contribution. That higher level stays that way uh, until about 2037. And so you get about three years earlier uh, to get to the the um, hey Bill yeah um so that one is where we look at the um, the assumption changes or the investment changes that are over the mark that we would be going to right and then yeah so only the ones that have more than 15 years remaining we shorten those to 15 years. And the assumption changes that have more than 20 years remaining, we shorten those to 20 years. So you can think of it as basically anything that happened in the last five years mm -hmm. uh, uh, shortened to a certain extent. Okay. Uh, Here's the direct comparison. So you can see how the, the funded percentage would be projected to, to emerge under the different options. Uh, you can see how the, the contributions relate to each other under the different options as we project going forward. Now, the current methods are reasonable. They are within the general guidelines. Uh, I think just about every plan other than CalSTRS is in California is within those guidelines. Nationally, that's not true. Um, so California has uh, been ahead of the curve in terms of getting the amortization periods within those guidelines. We are at the long end of the guidelines. That means we produce more stable contributions. 
they're lower now and it takes us longer to get to 100%. So that's the trade-off is the, the level and stability of contributions versus how quickly we get to 100%. If we just reduce the future amortization periods, it, it does not have uh, a significant effect immediately. It will when we have future gains and losses or future um, assumption changes. If we start accelerating the current amortization periods, that can get us to better funding more quickly, uh, but it can be expensive. And so that's the, the trade-off. We've shown three options here. There's obviously a lot of variations we could go into depending on um, what the board wants to accomplish. Um, but we picked kind of the, the two ends of the spectrum and then tried to find one uh, option in the middle. So with that, uh, I'll take any questions. I have a question, uh, and this is Trustee Kelleher. Um, how does inflation impact all this? Because I'm sure you're not factoring in 8% annual inflation. No. So uh, for this plan, uh, the primarily tier one, the COLAs are completely, well, almost completely independent of inflation. They are fixed at 3% regardless of inflation. And uh, there is a uh, purchasing power uh, provision that does affect a small group of retirees who retired a long time ago. Um, the primary place inflation has a direct impact on us is what happens with salary increases. Uh, and, and so we are watching that. We uh, do expect that we will have some losses on the salary increases, but that's only for active employees. And active employees only represent about 30% uh, of our liability. So does that work in our favor? Uh, to the extent that uh, in Inflation causes uh, interest rates to go up and improves future expected rates of return. It very much works in our favor. Or I guess you could say oh. <laughs> also in terms of uh, revenue uh, for the city, if, to the extent it increases due to inflation, that makes uh, those future payments cheaper. Yeah, and, and certainly uh, inflation is not working in any of our favor. but. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say it improves the funded ratio, or it would tend to improve it, right? Regardless so, of whose favor that might be. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, one of the weird things is what's really been hard for public pension plans and any pension plans over the last twenty years has been the decline in interest rates, uh, and that's just made it harder to achieve the investment returns that were expected. And so, to the extent we have a reversal of that, uh, it will make it easier to fund. Um, the plan. Certainly high inflation is not going to be uh, good for the, the members and the, their purchasing power and so forth. Uh, Trustee Obasti. Thank you, Thank you uh, Bill, for the presentation. Uh, so you uh, it seems like, you know, if we choose any of the alternatives, then it is favorable in terms of, um, you know, when you look at UAL, but when we look at the contributions, we are already at the topmost quartile uh, when it comes to contribution rates. My concern is if we, um, if we choose any of the alternatives, even the middle way, uh, let's take shorten, you have a slide on how it's going to impact the contribution rates. Yeah, so the I didn't put it in terms of rates. I just put it in terms of dollars here. And, but the proportionate impact on rates would be similar. So the, the blue line is what we were projecting without the change. The gold bar is, is with the change. And so it was uh, it was 211 million projected for 2024. So that's a $12 million increase in the next year for the city.
Does, does that answer your question, Trustee Avasti? Yeah, I was thinking, you know, you have that slide on uh, that slide five, which basically puts in the uh, the contribution rates and, and yeah. the quota is where they are, I think. Can we uh, go back and see that one? If if we can actually see how the rates will impact and because it's going to provide a picture of how is it going to impact our sponsor, right? Uh, yes. So uh, I don't know. Jackie or Stephen, do you have the model open and can say what happens to the 55%? Yes, I'll, I'll run that. It should increase our funding, right? Yeah, it'll increase the 55%, but yeah. the question is how much? And the reason we're so high on that very, one of the first is just that we're unfunded. And which scenario do we want to see exactly? The um, the short and the long periods. Mm -hmm. And again, if we make the change for all futures, it won't change the Con the sponsor's rate at this point? It, no, it would only have an impact on whatever gains or losses or assumption changes we make in the, in the future, future valuations, yeah. including the 2022. We just right. don't have um, don't have that information finalized. Right. Hey, well, while we wait for that number, maybe we'll move to uh... Uh, Council Lederman, you have your hand raised. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And on behalf of the board, if I may ask a couple of questions. And Bill, thank you for coming and bringing back uh, these demos and options. Very much appreciated. One of the charts, Bill, that I was hoping that you might be able to show to the board this time around was where where this fund stands relative to its peers in terms of funded status. So I don't see that. And so maybe I can ask you among your public pension fund clients nationally, how many funds are under 60% funded status, actuarially funded? Uh, nationally, there, there are uh, quite a few, but uh, in California, it's pretty rare. There are no, none under 60% in California, are there? Uh, I don't I don't recall off the top of my head, but that may be correct. We may I mean, other than that. maybe the closed city of Oakland police and fire plan, um, I think other than that, among our peers in California, we are at the worst funded status of any public plan. I think, isn't that right? Uh, I think that's... Uh, that's probably correct. So if could you pull up your slide six right before this one for a moment? So I see the projected funding percentage, that nice line that's going to take us to 100%. But of course, we know that is not going to happen and that it hasn't happened in the past. Could you, can't do it off the top of your head right now, of course, or create a chart. But I wonder if you took any rolling 20 year period um, from the past and changed your projected funded, you know, to, to reality, what it would look like, whether we would ever get anywhere, uh, anywhere near to fully funded, uh, because we know this isn't gonna happen. And one of the reasons I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that we know it's not going to happen is because it, in the past, one of the, because we've had to change our actuarial assumptions because the assumptions never came true and the change in assumptions always increased not decreased the funded status and the underfunding of the system shouldn't we be looking at a more realistic picture of what is more likely to happen that in the past forever has created missed assumptions and adjustments to assumptions that have added to the unfunded liability, instead of looking at this optimistic 
you know, beeline up to 100% over the next 20 years. I mean, is that something that you could, you have the ability to replicate any, to pick any rolling 20 year period of actual experience and give us a more accurate projected path towards where that takes us to a funded status. Is that, would that be possible? Well, first, you know, I think the reason we have changed the assumptions is to make them more realistic. And right. So uh, comparing uh, today's assumptions to the assumptions that were used for this plan 20 years ago, uh, in terms of their realism, even from that point in time, uh, in my opinion, they're in completely different places. Haven't all the assumptions, though, missed always in the, in the direction of creating more unfunded liability than less? No, they have not. Okay. Um, the, it, you know, we've had, in particularly, the salary increase assumption, uh, if you went back 20 years, what, was much higher than what actually happened. Hmm. So that, that uh, was a positive and, effect. Yeah. And so, and retirement rates have bounced around, termination rates have bounced around. Um, the, the refund assumption was way off in the past, but I don't think that's off anymore or would be off going forward. The big well, thing- Mortality was, mortality was probably a bigger factor. Mortality- people, people, living, people living a lot longer. Mortality was clearly off. Uh, and then actually, the, some of the more recent changes in mortality uh, were gains because we rolled back because of COVID. optimistic uh, projections of future improvements of mortality. Because if you look at mortality history from the mid 90s to 2010 or so was a period of great mortality improvement for the country that we have not sustained since then. Yeah. So we adjusted our assumptions for that to continue and then it has not. And, and those assumptions have gradually come back. The, the big change also though, it is interest rates in the market. In, in 2000, you could get a 6% yield on treasuries. And, right. and that is a huge piece that has driven our investment return assumptions down and um, and increased the risk that we've taken in uh, pension portfolios to right. try and compensate. So what are you then, if you're suggesting that we're re going to repeat that going forward, you're projecting a world with treasury rates near zero for the foreseeable future, I guess. Uh, well, well, if we might see the previous slide because I think the, the biggest changes have been uh, the previous to that, previous to that, sorry, uh, keep going back. There we go. I mean, the biggest changes we have made and the most impactful have been the changes to the discount rate, which is our assumed rate of return, which have come down significantly. The board has taken a hard and painful work of being much more realistic now. Right. And the discount rate as a result came down, then stabilized and is now increasing. So I think the, the idea that we're not gonna meet these projections going forward, uh, I would call that assumption into, into question. I believe we're in a much more stable place where the future assumptions are much more likely to be met. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just one other point or question I'd like to ask Bill about, and that is about the amortization uh, schedules. Um, anytime you go over about 17 years on an amortization schedule, you fall, and Bill can confirm this, you fall into what's considered to be negative amortization. In other words, the contributions just cover the interest, they never eat away at the principal amount of the amount due. Wouldn't it be prudent to at least to start improving the funded status, at least any amortization schedule that we have to get it down below 17, like in the 15 range, 
and and start at least allowing every some of the dollars that the city pays towards the unfunded liability to start paying down the principal instead of just paying off interest on the debt. So um, first, the your premise is not correct. It used to be correct, but uh, based on uh, based on our current discount rate and the increase. In, uh, we use 2.75% to increase our amortization payments each year. Based on those assumptions, the interest only is at about 23 years, 22 or 23 years. Uh, oh. And that was something that we were covering last, last month, but um, the 17 years was back when we were using an 8% interest assumption and something like three and a half or four for the amortization increase, then you would have been at 17. But that's part of what we're talking about here is we yeah. have made that transition so that now contributions are paying off the principal on the amortization. So, so we are past that point uh, already. And it's a very small slice, though. It is a very small slice. Um, and, you know, part of that is where we are in the amortization process. So we aren't paying down uh, huge amounts, but we are paying down a pretty significant amount. But part of it is just the scale of the plan. Uh, I think Prabhu noted, uh, you know, the difference in investment returns over those three years was 672 million. That's more than three years of contributions. That that would be like more than doubling our contribution um, it, over that three year period. So um, contributions are like the steady drip that pays down the unfunded liability. But when we have a $2 billion unfunded liability, and our total contribution is just over 200 million. Uh, you're going to see it as a small slice uh, each year, a hopefully growing slice each year that eats away at that payment or at that unfunded liability. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Council Liaison Davis has had her hand raised. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Horowitz. I, I just wanted to uh, give everybody the kind of the full picture of your your where where these extra dollars would come from. And I, I want to highlight, first of all, the slide five that our contribution yeah. rates are already amongst the highest. I think Bill said we were in our we were in the 95th percentile for California, and we're we're definitely at at, among the highest in, in the entire United States. The stability of contributions is extremely important to the city budget. I think you all know, and it's almost become trite to say, but it is true that we are one of the most thinly staffed city halls in all of the United States for any big city. And our budgets are extremely tight. Just to give you one example, every dollar that goes to additional contributions is a dollar that we cannot spend on services for our residents. Yesterday, just yesterday, we talked about the fact that our ratio of police officers to residents is one per 1,000. We have one police officer per 1,000 residents. The national average is 2.4 officers per 1,000 residents. Just to give you a sense of how thinly staffed we are in just one department. And that's for our police department, which arguably is one of our, you know, if not our top priority, one of our very top priorities because of public safety being our primary responsibility as a city to our residents. So I just want you all to know, fewer additional services are services that are still very badly needed in our community. 
Um, and I, I would try, I would like to make the case that keeping everything the same in a time when, first of all, if you're talking about the emerging uh, change, lowering the, the amortization for emerging returns, last year's returns were great. And this year's returns are not looking great. So we would have a longer amortization from what I'm, and Bill, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the way that I'm looking at that is we would have a longer amortization for the positive for last year and a shorter amortization for what is likely to be a negative this year. That differential, it looks like nothing to you now because on, this, on the projections because we don't know how the year is going to turn out but we're over halfway through that. We're three quarters of the way through the year. I think we have some idea. Every additional dollar that we have to spend above the, of the, above the projections now, again, are dollars that we're not gonna be able to spend on additional services for our residents. So I just wanted to make that point while you're all considering this, that I, I understand Harvey, your, your you know, wanting the board to consider their fiduciary duty, but considering their duty to the public is not only about this funded status, it's about also what, what the impacts of their decisions are on residents and the services that they receive. Thank you, uh, council member. Uh, any other trustees have any questions? Could I go back to Trustee, uh, Trustee Alvarez, uh, Amashi's question? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, increasing that contribution rate, um, it's going to increase it from a little over 55 to very close to 59 percent. So it's it's a it's a big jump. And I think that segues nicely from what uh, Council Member Davis just had to say. Well, and is that the this is the very large change. What about the next one? Well, so if you did just the, uh, if you did the media change. Yeah, that wasn't the very large change. Yeah, that, that was, was the normal change. Yeah. Oh, that was the, where you take. That's the additional 12 million. Oh, okay. Wow. And, and is that immediate or is that? Yes. Wow. In the way we've structured it is immediate. I mean, there are, if the board wanted to get to these contribution levels, but do it over time, we could come back with a, a mechanism to do that. Hmm. Um, okay, so that's the 12, all right. Mr. Chair, can I ask a question of Bill? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I just want to make sure that trustees have questions or have made the comments of the public in general. Mm -hmm. All these council indicated this bill, and I think I, I made this comment every time when we have projections, right, that it, it assumes the uh, all the assumptions that will be met. Um, these numbers, even the, the, the numbers that we are projecting based on the possible changes, actually, it does take into consideration whatever changes we're considering for the amortization, but it's not taking into account any potential changes to the assumptions, correct? That's correct. Okay, I just wanna, <laughs> wanna make that point. <laughs> Yeah, so there, there's a couple things just to clarify here. Uh, one, we have the estimated asset impact for the investment losses through June 30th, 2022. Uh, and so th that impact is what you're seeing as the difference between the blue line and, and the top of the gold bars. So that part is uh, built in. Uh, we are... We smooth those returns over five years. So um, to just a minor correction to council member Davis's uh, concerns, the 
80% of the gains from the 2021 would still be amortized over the, sh the shorter periods under the emerging, along with 100% of the losses from 2022. Those end up uh, balancing, and that's what you're seeing in these uh, top uh, gold bars. Thank you Thank for the you. correction, Bill. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to add to that. Thank you, Bill, for the, those explanations. Um, and then thank you to Councilmember Davis, right? This is one of the reasons you have your city council liaison so that you can keep your prize of the business of the city because it's important. I mean, this is a very difficult subject. It, it is very important, extremely critical. And um, above anything else, we want to make sure that you have as many data points as, and information as possible, which is very helpful to hear from the city council member providing you some uh, further information that is not in this graph about future implications of any consideration of uh, decreasing uh, these amortization periods. I also wanted to let you know, we try very hard to work closely with the city and to keep them apprised about discussions and common upcoming decisions uh, by your board that has implications uh, in this case, financial implications to the city. So we also share uh, this public uh, information that is presented here this morning with them beforehand. Mm -hmm. And so with you here this morning, and I don't, I don't wanna put you in the spot, uh, Jim, is Jim Channon. He is the city budget director. I'm just sort of letting you know uh, because he is actually listening to the meeting and he certainly um, uh, can address any questions that any of you board members may have uh, in terms of uh, hopefully helping you uh, settle uh, any thoughts so, to, so you can make a decision. And we also have our uh, city uh, liaison, Sherry Parkman as well as always attending the meeting. So um, the city project director did share with me some, uh, some uh, communications and comments uh, early in the week uh, in regards to the possible implications of, uh, of some of the decisions that will be considered uh, I think, um, you know, I, I, I won't go into those details. I'll let Jim mention that if this is something he would like to do, but I think Council Member Davis did touch base on some of those implications. Uh, that said, uh, again, this is a, a difficult subject matter, uh, but an important one, and, and certainly it's a fine line, right? Because, because on the one hand, you want to make sure that um, you consider the implications to the employer uh, when you're making decisions, while at the same time making sure that you're making a decision that, that is, uh, has a positive impact to the members of the plan. And um, certainly um, doing anything you can to improve uh, the funding ratio uh, from where it is today and helping it to uh, hopefully accelerate that funding ratio in the future is something that it is uh, an important factor for you to consider. So I do not know where the right uh, balance is, but uh, I wanna make sure that you do have all the uh, information that you need to make an informed decision. So with that, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, I'll, I'll just turn it back to you. Thank you. And this is a very important decision. Uh, Trustee Kelleher, did I hear you trying to weigh in uh, earlier? Yeah, no, I, I was just gonna say, I think there is a, a real balance because we need to make sure that um, the city of San Jose has the uh, the funds to uh, provide services. So the city of San Jose is a, uh, a place to live, a place to work in. And, um, but we also need to protect our, our beneficiaries. And uh, there is a balance. We can't just say, um, we'll protect our beneficiaries, but we have to uh, make sure that the uh, city of San Jose is a place to live and has the revenue and all that sort of stuff to uh, be a place to live. Thank you. Uh, Harvey, I, I, I hope I did not uh, confuse my fiduciary loyalties. 
No one would say that, uh, Trustee Keller. Okay. You're, you're on solid ground. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings has her hand raised, please. Yeah, I actually uh, raised my hand this time, guys. Um, all right, so I'm looking at this chart on page seven, and I just want to reconfirm what I'm seeing here. So this is the blue line or whatever the line is. It's the 2021 projection of contributions that we gave and that Jim budgeted with. The amount over that is based on the latest performance from this uh, last fiscal year. So, and then I have a two part to that, but can you just confirm that? That has nothing to do with any change in any assumptions. Correct. That is just the impact of the investment performance for fiscal year end 2022. Okay. And then my second part to that as well is that is, although that's not making, I'm sure, Jim happy, um, but it is in recognition that this performance that we had for last year still put us at the seventh percentile of our peers. And if we had not had the asset allocation and the investment team's expertise, it could have been much more dire. Maybe Brad Poo can answer that. Yeah. So talk. if the investment returns were worse, and I think to the, the point that was made earlier, worse over the last three years in particular, then yes, the contributions would be higher and, and probably much higher if you're talking about a $672 million difference, um, they would probably be much higher. Okay, so I do want to recognize that because although we're not happy, you know what, the world is not happy. Um, each individual investor who manages their own like retirement or whatever are not happy, but this could be far worse without the team we have and without the leadership we have. And I want to throw that out there before we like throw them under the bus because this doesn't look good. Um, and then if we're looking at assumption changes, the only other thing, Bill, um, there was when we were looking at where we are within the other peers, you know, um, you know, the, and it was like, yeah, um, kind of like it was the years, you know, it's the 20 to 25, whatever. Um, if we only changed the assumption, you know, and, and took that from, I don't know, I think it's at 20 and took it to 15. I don't know. It's where you're showing how everybody else is. Yeah, that. Or, yeah. yeah, that guy. So the, the investment, the one to the left, you know, we're, we're in with the pack, right? You know, there's 12 that are at 20, there's 13 that are 15. I, I don't know why we have to change or, or can, you know, do that. What, but the other one, we're at 25 and there's only three and the pack is more or less at 20. So if we were to do something like that, and those are assumption changes, right? Mm -hmm. That might be a lot less. And, you know, to be, I would rather consider something like that. I'm good with kind of where we are on the investment piece. And I love the fact that it would get us to 60 because being the only one that's really low, I mean, it's never been good. And I know Mayor Licardo is not happy about that either. Um, but if we're just comparing ourselves where we are with everybody else, you know, the assumption change seems to be more where we should get, you know, similar. And I, I know you've done all your numbers based on both, but, you know, to be honest, I don't know how the other trustees consider it, but I, I would like to see what that might be. So just throwing that out there. And I will, uh, um, I think someone else had their hand up, so. So I would just say, uh, if 
if we are interested in seeing it, we do have our interactive model here and I could uh, try and quickly plug that. Yeah, in. that would be great. If you could, I'd like to see what that is. Um, you know, and I, I think, you know, I guess my standing at this point is I don't want to go cold turkey. And um, I would be more inclined either towards, you know, just getting the outliers back into the, or to go to the future, you know, where we in the future look at trying to get us a little more there because we do have to be cognizant of what it does to our sponsor as well. I, I also um, sort of feel like we have our assumptions that we did what six months a year ago and we are in a and, very and are due to do again in the next few months. Yeah, but we're uh, in a very different world uh with inflation uh with uh, just a lot of different things and i wonder if we should update our assumptions before we make a decision like this good point um mr hallmark if you can while you're checking that with your interactive model let me go to some of the other trustees who have their hands raised i I believe sure. I have Mr. Trustee Chandra uh, first. Yeah, uh, not sure uh, if this is helpful to bring it up now or we can table it for later, but I do wonder where pension obligation bonds might fit into the equation. Um, and uh, the interest rates are worse now, uh, and that's always a, uh, a bet against paying a, a certain fixed rate and hoping you can outperform that in the uh, with your investment returns. Um, so. I, I haven't thought it through. I don't even know what current rates are. I don't know what San Jose could borrow at in the current environment, but it seems to me that's another lever and maybe something we can discuss or reconsider um, at a later date. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, I uh, took out a mortgage at 3% six <laughs> months ago, and uh, now it's uh, over six. Well yeah. Done. Yeah, I have a feeling uh, POBs are off the table in the current interest rate environment, although Me I have too. no idea what city council is imagining. Um, yeah. All right, it looks like uh, Mr. Hallmark has an interactive for us. So before we go to the next uh, questioner. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is our interactive model. We've got the projection of the liabilities on the top here. The lines are the assets funded ratio uh, across here. We've built in the current year's investment performance. And then at the bottom, we have the projected member contributions, city contribution, uh, and the comparison to the 2021 projection. Uh, on the far right, this is what's new. We we have this control over each of the amortizations here. And just to quickly um, show you, I've forced anything that was uh, 25, anything greater than 20 down to down to 20. Whoops, I missed one here. And uh, so the contribution goes up to, for 2024, to 55.5. I think it was 55.3 before. So, uh, so that just changing the assumption basis using the uh, shorten the long approach, the mid approach, has uh, a pretty minor impact. Uh, it also does not really uh, get us to be fully funded uh, before 2041. So no material impact either way if we change the amortization schedule just for assumption changes. Correct. It, it would have an increase, but not... Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a very minor increase. Mm. Yeah, here we're seeing the the dollar impact and and it's uh, 
very minor. And that's because in the last five years, our assumption changes have been relatively minor. The big mm -hmm. assumption changes were made before that. But it also doesn't increase the sponsor amount, right? Right. That's what we're showing. Okay. About. So it could be, uh, if we were to do that, it would get our assumptions in line with the other California. Is it just California we're comparing it to? Yes. Yeah. So to the other California pension plans, but really not address the funded rate, but also not impact the sponsor. Right. Okay. I see uh, Trustee Avasti's hand raised, but I believe uh, Council Liaison uh, Davis's hand was raised first, so I'll come to her first. Thanks. Just one uh, quick question about this this point that uh, Trustee Jennings was making, um, and and I don't remember who else was here while the last time we we talked about amortization lengths and why we had the assumption changes be so long. But as far as I remember, part of it was because we we knew the board was going to continue to decrease the assumed rate of return over time. And Bill, maybe you can, maybe you remember that, but I, that's my kind of recollection of why um, why why the board elected to leave the amortization the way it was for or in fact it might have ch actually changed from 30 to 25 um but there was that discussion about well if we're going to continue decreasing the assumed rate of return maybe we don't want to mess with the amortization as as much or at the same time so i appreciate i think it was a uh, trustee chandra who who was talking about you know, if we're going to revisit the assumptions, maybe it makes sense to revisit the amortization of the assumptions at the same time, as opposed to having these two conversations separately, because they're, you're right, if we say, oh, you know, we're going to leave the assumed rate of return the same, it doesn't change the city contribution all that much. I think it it's three, I think it's about $3 million. Is that right? Um over what 2024 was going to be, but maybe I'm wrong. I did, I have been losing track of the amount. Um, so I understand wanting to be in line, but also if you're going to make two changes that increase the contribution amount in one year, amortization and assumption would be good to know what, what it would be good to make those decisions together. Thank you. So just to give uh, my recollection of the history, um, back in 2007, the system was using what's called a 30-year rolling amortization, um, which is really not a, a recommended method. It's a long period, but then every valuation, you reset it to 30 years. So it, it, it's sort of like refinancing your house every year um and resetting the those payments so you never make progress uh on paying down the unfunded so part of what drove the contribution rates higher was us shortening those amortization periods uh and and doing it relatively quickly at a time when we were making significant assumption changes and so i think part of the decision was given the significant assumption changes we were making and the impact that was having to spread that cost over a longer period of time. Because that that also, assumption the idea of doing assumption changes over a longer period is that that's really a reset of all your past costs. It's a reassessment of all your past costs. It's not something that you just experienced this year. Um, so that that would be the rationale for having a longer period for assumption changes. But um, having said that, you know, 20 years is right in the middle of that recommended range and, and is what most of the systems are using. Okay, thank you. Trustee Avasti. So do, uh, do any of these alternatives impact the member contribution rates? They do not. 
So the member contribution rates are impacted if we change the discount rate, uh, but the unfunded liability, uh, and, and here we're only talking about tier one. So tier one members do not pay for the unfunded liability. If we were making similar changes on tier two, uh, there would be a cost to the members, but we're only focused on tier one here. Thank you. An important point. Uh, Mr. Polani, I have next. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick uh, comment. Um, Council Member Davis uh, spoke about the assumed rate of return. And I have to say, you know, the two-year treasury last year uh, was yielding 21 basis points, and it's now yielding 3.78%. I mean, it's a significant increase in the expected rate of return on the two-year treasury. Now, Will that sustain? Will the Fed quash inflation and will rates go down? I don't know. I mean, we do have a slightly inverted yield curve, so it's hard to predict all of that. But just given you know the fact that the S&P 500 was around 4,800 at the beginning of the year, it's now at 3,900, uh, one can actually make a case that the assumed rate of return can go up. Uh, so I just wanted to make that point. And I believe Makita has actually uh, come out with mid-year revised capital market expectations, which they, which they rarely do, which point to higher expected returns longer term. So I just wanted to throw that out there. It, I think that's a very good point. And we will be bringing that information back to the board next month uh, when we're reviewing the discount. Rate. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Keller, I believe you had your hand raised, but- I, I did, and that was uh, reconsidered. No, no, no. Actually, uh, Trustee Avaste and uh, CIO Polani uh, sort of hit both points for me. Great, great. You know, it's just uh, I, we need new data. We're in a new world. Mm -hmm. Right. And we do revisit the assumptions, particularly the one for discount rate or assumed rate of return. We, we revisit that every year in the fall. And so we are about to, to take another look at that. Thank um, you. Norman. Any other trustee comments? Are there any public comments or questions? Uh, if you'll indulge me, let me share my own thoughts. Uh, if we go back to the slide, I believe it was at page five the one I referenced earlier. All right, just a second here. Page five. Yeah, the one that shows the progress in the in the funded ratio over the last 15 years. One more, four, three, I forget which number. There we go. Um, the funded ratio is low and we may be the only uh, plan in California below 60%. As I pointed out though, we have made enormous strides in being getting our plan realistic. And we now have a, a discount rate, an assumed rate of return that is below our five-year actual rate of return, which was 7.2%. We have stabilized the funded ratio and now are increasing the funded ratio over the, each of the last two years. And we have not yet recognized 60% of the gain in our blockbuster year 2021. So we have every reasonable expectation that this funded ratio will increase in each of the next three years, bringing us above 60%. I do, do not believe we are in a critical situation where we need to change any of our amortization schedules. I believe we have a plan to reasonably reduce the underfunded liability going forward. And we have turned the corner where we are actually paying down the principal and not just the interest. So it is my con contention that we do not need to make any changes at this time. 
that we are well within the norms for these amortization schedules and that we are making progress and have every reason to expect continued progress. So with that, I will open it to anyone who would like to make a, a motion, bearing in mind that we do not need to make any changes, only if someone wishes to make a change. <clears throat> Uh, Chair Horowitz, I just wanted to uh, comment that um, I agree with your conclusion, but I also do think it might be worthwhile to do some of the um, work that Trustee Kelleher has referred to. I know we will be reviewing the discount rate, so that's already going to take place and is agendized for the future. Mm -hmm. um, but in some form, um, it may be worthwhile just to think about assumptions. I, I understand what Bill said, and um, it, it was very helpful to me. I mean we shouldn't be reacting to a year or two, nor should we be trying to project the future if we see significant changes over uh, a significant backward looking period to what our assumptions have been, you know, then it probably makes sense to revisit, but it just might be interesting just to have that dialogue anyway, just to level set as a group. Well, that sounds like an excellent idea. When we do re uh, come to our annual review of the discount rate, if we could review what the change uh, of the amortization, amortization schedule for the discount rate would be uh, as well at the same time. Uh, that would make, help us make a more informed decision. I suspect the, the larger uh, impact will be by changing the uh, discount rate itself and not the amortization schedule. So <laughs> sure, I agree. And, I if agree. We are, and if we are in a new world and, and uh, new assumptions are to be made, that should be properly reflected in the discount rate. So I, I do have a question for uh, CIO Plani. Um, do you think that we should raise the uh, discount rate? Potentially, well, I, I would say I would say, Trustee Kelleher, just based on market movements, um, I think it's very reasonable to raise the discount rate. Uh, this is not taking into account that we're going into go to a recession and you know we don't know how profits are going to be impacted and there will be layoffs and consumer spending will go down negative impact on gdp and so forth and we down, down, down the gurgler yeah i mean no one's good at forecasting so let's just throw the forecasting out but just just given where prices are i think one can reasonably make the argument that yes expected rate of return should go up right well Thank that is a question for another day, but I will simply observe that if we were to raise the discount rate, that would improve, improve our funded ratio and my pie itself pop us above 60%. Yes. Um, okay, I guess we have a slide that actually addresses that. Yeah, so we did put in the appendix uh, an estimate of what our 2021 funded ratio would have been at different discount rates. Um, so we were, based on the market value of assets at the time, we were 63% funded. Um, and going to 7% would have increased it to 66, so half 71. So, uh, Bill, um, and certainly, uh, Harvey, I, I don't want to go over my skis, but what does that mean in terms of funding rates for the city of San Jose? Uh, <laughs> well, that depends on how we amortize it too. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't have that uh, ready for this presentation, but we will have something next month for you uh, so that you can look at that. But, but safe to say- Safe again, to so say it would be lower. It would reduce the contribution. Yeah. Yep. Well, if there are no further questions, no further discussion, and no motions to be made, then let us proceed to the next agenda item. All right. Thank you. Thank Sounds you so good. much for this very informative uh, presentation, Mr. Hallmark. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> Uh, 
uh, new business. Is that we're up to 5A, oral update from the CEO. Mr. Pena. I believe you're on mute. <laughs> I believe you're still on mute. Roberto. You know, and I said so many nice things and I just realized no one heard me. <laughs> Isn't I was that just saying, um, it's hard to follow uh, this discussion. Um, was very educational. Thank you, Bill, so much. And honestly, thank you to um, everyone else that, that have comments and thoughts on the matter. Uh, very, very helpful. And um, certainly uh, uh, a lot more additional food for thought. I thought you bore a um, decision to have further discussion and potentially make a decision when you have more data points uh, and more of that information is, uh, is an appropriate one. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the discussion this morning. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll try to be quick. Um, I'm excited to uh, share with you and I'm very happy to welcome two new benefit uh, senior analysts to the office. Uh, these were positions that were approved uh, with the budget for the new year. So thank you very much. Uh, both of them started on September 6th and they come to us with considerable experience, many years experience within the city. First, Teresa Mayer uh, joined us uh, to work uh, as a senior analyst in the health area. She come to us from, uh, PRNS from the city, and then Hanban, uh, which is uh, the senior on the pension side, come to us from DOT. So uh, welcome to both of them to our office. We're excited to have you both on board and uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Uh, at the same time, we uh, are working on recruitment activities for the, the third position that you bore and the city council approved for us for the new year uh, on the senior supervisor position. So um, we will keep you posted on how that, uh, that process ensue and uh, hopefully we can work on someone on board soon. Uh, it is October, I'm sorry, it is September, but getting close to November, which means that open enrollment uh, for healthcare, uh, which takes place on November 1st to the 30th is in progress. Um, we are uh, in the middle of um, um, developing our open enrollment packets, which we hope to uh, deliver by mail to our members uh, next month. And right now, um, given everything as, as, as have, have uh, been developed with uh, COVID-19, right now we're actually planning on our first in-person health fair in a few years. Um, we don't expect that to change, but if something happens, we will let you know. And in addition to that, we uh, will have multiple opportunities for members to uh, um, attend virtual online webinars uh, by our vendors. So uh, we will certainly keep everyone apprised of that information, not only on our website, but when we reach out to the members uh, through the open enrollment. Um, staff will also be making a presentation on open enrollment to the San Jose Retirement Employees Association at the October meeting. That will be Thursday, October 13. And lastly, a couple of things. The city uh, lifted the masking uh, on Monday, uh, last Friday, uh, for Monday, September 12th. And I uh, wanted to let you know and the public that our office will be closed on Monday, October 10th in observance of Indigenous People Day holiday. So. That concludes my uh, oral update, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Pena. Are there any questions from trustees? Or any questions from the public? All right, hearing none, we'll move to the next agenda, I-5B, an update from the uh, City Council Liaison. Ms. Davis? Thank you, Chair Horwitz. I I don't have an update today. We've been uh, plugging along with very light agendas lately, so there's not much news to report. Okay, light agendas. I'm very jealous. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, well, in defense of uh, Councilmember Eliasson, light agendas at the council are probably lighter than you would think they are. 
I'm sorry, they're not as light as you think they are. Perhaps not, perhaps not. Uh, certainly when it comes to public comment. Um, uh, then we move forward to 5C, discussion and action on the annual merit increase for the CEO and CIO positions. Um, we have had this extensive discussions in closed session. Uh, we have gone through an extensive uh, review process, a new process for this year. Uh, let's take each in turn. Our CEO uh, received an outstanding uh, 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 rating on his uh, performance for this past year. And we were all extremely pleased and he's received very positive comments from trustees as well as an excellent track record uh, in his performance. Uh, as uh, discussed, the position has already uh, received a 4.5% contract rate or COLA rate or base rate. I've heard various terms for it. And we were discussing the potential of a performance increase uh, in addition to that. Uh, police and fire have preceded us. And in their discussions, they have uh, uh, agreed a range of four to five percent. We, uh, as a board, were much more enthusiastic about our uh, uh, CEO's performance, uh, but we also feel the need to uh, to come to some agreement across the boards in order to implement the increase. Um, so, with that said, are there any comments from trustees, or would anyone like to formulate? a proposal on the rate increase for performance. Yes, I have something to say. Please, Vice Chair Jennings, proceed. So one, I would like to recognize the strong performance of both our CEO and CIO over the last fiscal year. This performance has provided extraordinary plan value to both our sponsor, employees, and retirees. As noted previously, we are now in the seventh percentile of our peers and our beta point, our, our beta is 0.7. Based on this performance, I so motion the following merit and executive days for our CEO and CIO. Oh, let's take those one at a time. Those have let's, to be taken. Okay. So I'll have a motion for the CEO at this point. And my motion for the CEO is a 5% merit increase and five executive days. Very good. Do we have a second to that motion? I'll second it. And we have a second from Trustee Linder. The motion was made by Vice Chair Jennings. And so the motion is now open for discussion by trustees. Uh, if anyone would like to weigh in on that. I would uh, certainly support more uh, for uh, the CEO. However, I recognize that given the constraints of the city of San Jose, as well as um, optics, um, I think this is probably gonna be the best we can do. And uh, so I would support this. Okay, thank you. Any further trustee comment? Uh, this is Trustee Chandra. I'd like to echo what Vice Chair Jennings said. And uh, just, I know that uh, it's been said in other forum and in some of the uh, survey work that we've done to arrive at uh, the CEO's performance, but I actually wanted to say it in this forum. T Tremendous job. Thank you for your service. And uh, we're grateful to have you in the role. Thank you. Thank you very much. The chair would like to echo uh, Trustee Chandra's comments. We're enormously enthusiastic about the performance of our CEO and uh, hope to provide him with every compensation that we conceivably can. Is there any further trustee comment? Any public comment? So hearing none, we'll have a roll call vote. And this is for a merit increase of 5% and five additional management days. And uh, we'll go first to Trustee Chandra. Aye. Trustee Kelleher. Aye. Vice Chair Jennings. Aye. Trustee uh, Linder. Aye. And Trustee Abasti. 
Aye. And I vote aye as well, so it passes unanimously. Thank you. And now I'll hand it off to the chair of the uh, investment committee to discuss the CIO compensation. Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, Horowitz. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Someone in the last 15 minutes have developed a cough, so <coughs> bad timing. Um, well, so I, I think some of the background that uh, Chair Horowitz provided is also applicable to the review that was conducted for uh, CIO Polani, um, uh, self-evaluation, and then also input from our board and the police and fire. Um, just to refresh everyone's memory, we engaged in a new process last year, which we uh, uh, was helped. We were helped in developing it by uh, Cortex. Um, and the bottom line is that uh, our CIO received uh, an outstanding across all categories and for his overall performance. Um, I think notably for the CIO's office, um, you know, the performance of the plan is always first and foremost. And uh, while the markets are down, uh, we have um, beaten all of our benchmarks and continue to be in the, the top uh, few percentile. Uh, well, I actually want to get this right. I think it's top 19 percentile of uh, our peer plan. So um, it's, uh, it's been tremendous performance through significant headwinds. And everyone's familiar, obviously, with the prior fiscal year where we had, um, as I believe the chair refers to it, a blockbuster year. Uh, but more importantly, the feedback that the CIO has received from his staff and the support that he provides them, the leadership, the management, the mentorship has been excellent. Uh, the, the, the office has a stability um, I would so go far so far as to say is I believe we have while we have a small staff I believe we have the best staff in the state of California I'm I'm more than happy to debate our uh, peers uh, at the next uh, public forum conference on that and uh, that stability and uh, the the professional processes that have been brought to bear which I've witnessed firsthand as chairman of the investment committee have really positioned this plan not just for the the great results we've had over the past two or three years. But I think we now have a set of processes and, and uh, philosophy and way of doing things that will serve us um, well past the tenure of the current staff. And, and that uh, uh, has always been of vital importance to me that we institutionalize things uh, in, in a professional way using best practices so we can continue to chip away at that unfunded status, which we just had a rather lengthy conversation about. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that our uh, brethren at Police and Fire uh, also discussed in their uh, board meeting in uh, the open section um, their um, compensation um, determination for the CIO, and I believe that they have come up with a range of four to five percent and five executive days. Um, but uh, with that, I would love to hear my fellow trustees. Um, and their thoughts on uh, CIO compensation. Yes, um, I will um, go forward with my recommendation on this. Um, so police and fire um, went forward with theirs, but again, everything that uh, Trustee Chandra has said, everything that we have seen in this presentation, um, noting that we are in the seventh percentile, noting that we have moved up from the 99th percentile up to the seventh. I put at the feet of our CIO and his staff and his mentoring and his capability for making this happen. And I think it is critical that we recognize this, that we reimburse you know what the city is able to do for this performance and um, for the savings that it does as well to um, to our sponsor and to our employees. So um, I cannot um, go forward with what police and fire has said. Um, my recommendation in trying to keep to some semblance with our brethren, um, and recognizing their concerns is to put forward a 10% merit increase and five executive days. That is my motion. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings, uh, I certainly agree with you. 
mm. uh, that we need to re reward going from the 99th percentile to the 7th percentile. But we also have to recognize that that means $672 million. <laughs> Yeah, so we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. So, um, you know, I I wholeheartedly agree with you that at least a 10%. Yes. Uh, if not more. I mean, I think uh, Prabhu has been very balanced uh, and a steady hand on the tiller of, of this pinch point. Mm -hmm. And, no, I agree. Yeah. And I would go higher. I am trying to uh, find a balance with our um, brethren on the other side and um, hopefully get a merit increase that can go forward before it's the next MPP that we're doing. But um, I, I would go much higher. I, I am just trying to find the middle ground. And I agree with you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Mm -hmm. So is that a motion and a second for the <laughs> 10%? Am I to understand that? Or is that a general? That's a general discussion. comment for me. General discussion <laughs> point, OK? Perhaps we'd benefit from some more comments. Uh, I, and if you don't mind, I'd like to weigh in last, Chair Horowitz. Okay, I'll I'll give you that privilege certainly. Um, I have every respect for the CIO's performance. Uh, we have a, a an outstanding team. He promotes and um, uh, it, uh, the 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 team that we rely upon. I wonder if 10% uh, might be a bridge too far for us to come to some accommodation with police and fire. And noting that uh, the uh, several investment officers have received performance raises of between five and 7%, I wonder if 7% might be a more realistic goal uh, and one that conforms with uh, what was agreed for other members of the investment team. So that is where I come down on this. Uh, Chairman Horowitz, I also want to factor in the cost of replacing someone like uh, Prabhu. What, what is our process for doing that? Do we have to hire a uh, HR firm? What do we pay them? and factor the cost of replacements and also the uh, disruption and whether or not we get someone as good as Prabhu. I think those are all incredibly important considerations. I believe, yes, we would hire some type of headhunting HR firm. It would be an expensive and laborious process. And uh, I don't, we will hope that we can put in a program where we would not be losing our CIO. And of course, to that end, the JPC, as you may know, is discussing the implementation, in addition to this increase, of a new incentive bonus plan, modeled perhaps on the incentive bonus plans that other peer plans have established for their investment officers. Uh, and that might go some way towards uh, attracting and maintaining uh, an excellent investment staff. Thank you. And and to achieve that end, we will need the support, the wholehearted support of a city council, um, and and retaining their support may also depend on their view of our board's um, reasonableness in our requests of them at this point. It's a multi-stage game, and we need to probably look at all stages of the game. Yeah, I have to say, I, I can't go to 7%. Um, I just, um, that would make, I, I certainly think it should be higher, and I'm trying to compromise by 10. And I think what the presentation was just shown 
what uh, council member Davis saw and what our budget director saw was a performance, although they're not thrilled that it's going up, could have been much worse. Um, and it would be if we didn't have um, uh, Bapu at the at the helm. I am that's my strong assumption. And so I just me and and I understand how and I am a city employee and I wear another hat too as representing a union. And so I understand how city employees find this hard. Um, but I also understand how we look at what our people should be compensated at and their market value. And what Rabhu does is very different and he handles $6 billion. And given that, I think we need as employees to recognize that we want to have a pension when we retire. And we also um, want to be able to hire those police that council member Davis was talking about and knowing that it's not all going to the unfunded liability. So I think as an employee, as a union representative, and as a trustee that we need to support the talent that we have. And as much as trustee Kelleher said that it should be higher, which I agree, this is my compromise to try to keep our um, other um, brethren um, recognizing that we are compromising. Mr. Horowitz, given we have a couple of different numbers on the table, would it make sense to hear from other trustees? Uh, if I think so. And certainly we'd like to hear, uh, I know you promised to weigh in at, at the end, but uh, it would be very welcome to hear from other trustees where, where their thinking might be here. And recognizing this is very uncomfortable in a public forum to be discussing such private details and uh, but that is the transparency requirement of these public positions. Sure. I can weigh in, Mr. Chair. Um, Please. I have um, been very impressed with the reports that we've seen today. The extra, uh, the jump in our, uh, our funding in the 672 million of additional value all very impressive. Uh, I tend to um, lean more towards uh, your position, Mr. Chair, that this is a two-step process. And I think something that 7% uh, is more comfortable for me, given the two-step process that we're in. If we were not in that, I would lean more towards the higher amount, but I'm also recognizing that we're, we're in that two-step thing and we're going to be going to the council. It will be um, um, with both steps over this next year. So um, that's where my my thinking is, is uh, to go with the two-step process and to go with the 7% that you've suggested. Uh, uh, Trustee Linder, thank you. Um, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to ask for a uh, Council liaison, uh, Council Davis, uh, what are your thoughts on this, given that we've moved from 99% to uh, the top 7% and have had a $672 million increase uh, in pension assets under uh, CIO Polani? Do you, do, do you feel like a 7% increase in salary? I mean, what are you willing to pay for a $672 million increase? I think that's a great question. Um, you asked what I think, uh, although I'm supposed to represent the entire council, I don't know that I can answer for the entire council. And and, I, and I'd also like to caveat what, I, what I'm about to say with, with the fact that I don't know where uh, Mr. Polanyi is in in his salary range, um, and I don't know what, off the top of my head, what his increases have been over the last few years. So I, I 
Council Liaison, he's at it. He's at the cap now, and last year was 10 percent. I believe the year before was five, uh, roughly, approximate. Okay, thank you for that. That's very helpful. Um, so I I think given given the outstanding performance of of the last few years, I I could see a seven percent increase um, being being reasonable. I don't know what him being at the top of his um, pay scale means for any compaction issues beyond a, our regular um, increase amounts. So I don't. That's that's why I have to caveat what I what I said about about the seven percent. It seems reasonable to me given the given the returns, but I don't know what that means for the rest of of the city salary schedule and how and how it might impact that or if it does i i actually don't, don't it even wouldn't know. it's only if we increase the salary range so this is but if I he's mean, at the top of his salary it'll range just be right a now, bonus then it, it'll just be a bonus it won't be pensionable it'll be a bonus oh this is just a bonus well that's what it is. i didn't understand yeah. that part of the it, it would it would effectively be well in it, the mo it is not the motion per se but effectively because he is at his cap it would be a one-time addition to right. uh, his compensation for this year and would not be a part of his compensation next year. That would require the boards to determine what that would be in that yeah. fiscal year. And it would be non-pensionable because right. it's not within the range. Right. So it's a one-time amount. He got 5% last got year. got 10% last year. And 10%. last year, five the year before. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And and our returns were were negative this past year, but they were in the seventh percentile. Still in the seventh through. percentile. Yeah. So I just want to. I'm just trying to talk this through because I haven't given this as much thought as as clearly you all have. Mm -hmm. um, I I I think that that in the five to seven percent range seems um, seems reasonable, but again, I can't speak for my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you for your input, though. I uh, think Trustee Avasi is trying to. Yeah. I value the contributions um, that Prabhu has made to the performance and, and the portfolio. Uh, I think 7% is reasonable, just balancing the retention and, and equity with the rest of the city. Okay, thank you. Well, I think at this point, uh, Trustee Chandra, all uh -huh. trustees have yeah. weighed in. Yeah. The, the um, zero hour is here. Well, uh, you know, uh, Vice Chair Jennings did me a great favor because I don't think I can improve upon the way she's described the performance and the value add. Um, and I'll also draft off of Trustee Kelleher in recognizing the importance of retaining this type of talent. I've been in the investment business a long time and you know, I will always take a mediocre money manager uh, over, uh, you know, in a booming market over the world's greatest money manager in a uh, bear market, but we don't get to choose our markets. And therefore, it is always good as your baseline to have an excellent steward of your assets under management. And um, if it were up to me, uh, just on my own, I would be much more directionally where Trustee Jennings and Trustee Kelleher are landing. Uh, and as you mentioned, Chair Horowitz, this is a bit uncomfortable to do in a public forum, uh, in a public setting, when we're talking about a matter that's so private. But um, I'm also mindful of uh, where I believe in my judgment police and fire is. Um, they have spoken publicly. I've heard those comments. Um, I've also been privy to some one-on-one -on -one conversations. And as the appointed labor negotiator for the CIO's compensation, um, I think there are two other things we need to consider. One is being expeditious and not having this drag out for a long period of time. And while I believe 10% is deserved and that 3% is probably meaningful, um, I also believe the two-step process we're going to engage in is going to require both boards to be fully supportive, fully engaged, united and allied in the effort to put forth the best proposal we can for a new compensation structure, including incentive compensation for the CIO and his staff. 
um, that I'm going to err on the side of uh, being a little more conservative and uh, agree with Chair Horowitz and uh, Trustee Linder and Trustee Abbasi that it may be more prudent to uh, recommend 7% at this time. So can I take that as a motion then, uh, Trustee Chandra? If there's no more discussion, I'm happy to make a motion. Well, we will discuss the motion once it's made, so uh, there'll be plenty true. of time to weigh in. Fair enough. So I will make a motion. Uh, uh, <laughs> Trustee Jennings had it worded so perfectly, but it, it's a motion to uh, compensation increase of 7% plus five executive days. I will second that. Okay, so we have a motion by Trustee Chandra and a second from Trustee Linder. Is there any further trustee discussion on the motion? Any public comment on the motion? So hearing none, uh, we will have a roll call vote. Uh, Trustee Chandra. Aye. Trustee Kelleher. Uh, I don't think it's enough, so I'm gonna say no. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings. I agree, I don't think it's enough. I'm gonna say no. Okay, Trustee Linder. Aye. Trustee Avasti? Aye. And as chair, I will vote aye. So the motion carries. And now uh, uh, Trustee Chandra has the, the task of negotiating again with police and fire. So we wish him Godspeed. I and good it. Yeah, and good luck in the wilderness. Yes. <laughs> it's not the Teamsters, so you'll be okay. Um, <laughs> As a uh, former uh, employee of Allen Biller and Associates, which represented the Teamsters, you are pleased that it's not the Teamsters. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that confirmation of my offhanded uh, observation. All right. Uh, thank you for the discussion. It's always, uh, it's always painful for me to discuss this in, in private nor in public. So either way, it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, but we appreciate our, our executive staff, their leadership and what they've achieved. And I hope that comes through uh, regardless of what numbers we assign to that. Uh, on to item agenda uh, 5D, discussion and action on authorizing the CEO to negotiate and execute a first amendment to the agreement with socially responsible partnerships, our social media vendor. Um, uh, Mr. Pena, I believe you present on this one. Um, no, that I will turn. The, I will defer to uh, Deputy Director uh, Barbara. Barbara, good morning. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Chair. Um, Barbara Heyman, Deputy Director for the Office of Retirement Services. Uh, this item is requesting board authorization to uh, negotiate and execute a First Amendment to the agreement uh, with socially responsible partnership, uh, the social media vendor to extend the term of the agreement through June 30th, 2024, um, at the same monthly amount of $1,557.50. Uh, so back in 2021, the CEO negotiated and executed an 18 month agreement with socially responsible partnerships uh, in the amount of the $1,557.50. Uh, per month, and uh, the cost is shared 50-50 between each of the two boards, Police and Fire and Yourselves Federated, um, and the budget for these services was approved by you board at, as part of the budget for the fiscal year 2022-23. Um, now, per board policy, uh, board approval is required uh, for any contract that would result in the cumulative contract value with any single vendor above 50,000 over two consecutive years, so um, which is the case for, the, for this agreement. Um, so far, we've been very happy with the services provided by socially responsible partnerships. And so staff are recommending authorizing uh, the CEO to negotiate and execute a first amendment to this existing agreement. Vice Chair Horowitz, can I make a motion? Uh, please. Uh, so I make a motion to approve uh, the amendment 
uh, and to extend the term and at the same monthly amount of $1,557.50. Good. Is there a second to that motion? I can second it, uh, Trustee Linder. Thank you, Trustee Linder. Uh, any further trustee discussion? Okay, any public comments? Okay, we will have a roll call vote on the motion. Trustee Chandra. Aye. Trustee Kelleher. Aye. Uh, Vice Chair Jennings. Aye. Trustee Linder. Aye. And Trustee Avasti. Aye. And I vote aye as well. The motion carries. And now we are on to item 5E. Uh, AB 361 is, uh, is uh, Council Chin here or will Council Lederman lead us on this? I'll, I'll channel my best Council <laughs> Chin. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we provided to the board uh, once again, uh, the evidence necessary for the board to make findings to enable the board to continue to meet in the abbreviated teleconference requirements uh, that were approved by AB 361. Um, so uh, what would uh, entertain is a motion to make the findings as outlined in the memorandum about the current uh, emergency status and recommended social distancing and for the board to continue to be able to meet in the next 30 days uh, pursuant to AB 361's uh, abbreviated uh, procedures. I'll also make a comment just so you know, we'll have more about this later. Uh, the legislative session just ended in Sacramento. The legislature passed uh, a, another AB, another assembly bill 2449 which creates yet another hybrid uh, for the next several years of the teleconferencing requirements that will not require an emergency declaration of the governor. Governor signed the bill, AB 2449, uh, day before yesterday. And so it's being chaptered. It does not go into effect till January 1. Uh, so between now and January 1, we'll outline to the board what are now three alternatives uh, available to the board for teleconferencing. Uh, I will tell you just as a teaser that AB 2449 is even more complicated <laughs> of a process than what we're going through right now. So they didn't do us any favors uh, in passing this bill, uh, but it is at least another alternative that we'll outline for you. For today, however, um, uh, we would entertain if I may say so, Mr. Chairman, a motion to adopt the findings as set forth in the memorandum and to continue meeting uh, pursuant to AB 361 for the next 30 days. Thank you. Thank you. So in fact, do we have a motion to accept? So move, Mr. Chair. We have a motion from uh, Trustee Linder and a second. I will Trustee second. Chandra. Oh, uh, sorry. Tr Kelleher beat me to it. Okay, we have uh, Trustee <laughs> Kelleher. So both marks weighing in. Any trustee discussion? Any public comment? Hearing none, we'll have a vote. Trustee Chandra? Aye. Uh, trustee Kelleher? Aye. Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. Trustee Avasti? Aye. And I vote aye as well. It passes unanimously. Thank you all. Uh, committee reports. 6-1 uh, Investment Committee, uh, Chair Chandra. Yes, uh, I don't have a comprehensive uh, update, but we did have a meeting on um, the, let's see, when did we have the meeting? I'm losing <laughs> track of time now. Um, uh, but uh, at our last meeting, we discussed, we got a really nice update on the public markets from senior investment offered Jay Kwan, and also always helpful um, speaking, you know, for myself here, the risk overview by Varus, I think uh, maintaining our, uh, staying within our risk budget and being mindful of, uh, not overexposing ourselves on beta has been critical to our success, and Veris does really good work for us. So I just wanted to note that. And other than that, I think we've got a couple of meeting minutes to file. Okay. Um, I forget, do we need a vote on receive and file or? Nope. No, just okay. to receive and file. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the governance committee. 
Uh, mm -hmm. It looks like the last, their last meeting was a special meeting. Uh, anything to report, uh, Chair Jennings? <clears throat> no. Okay, thank you. Audit committee, their last meeting also was a special meeting. Anything to report, Chair Keller? Uh, no, nothing to report. Thank you. Uh, joint personnel uh, committee. Um, we did have a meeting on September 9th. Uh, Chair Orr was not in attendance for that meeting nor for this meeting. Um, so perhaps I'll address it. Um, we did have an extensive review of uh, two uh, studies. One was on competitive CEO compensation and the other was on uh, CIO compensation and incentive programs. Uh, this was a survey done that we uh, paid for from McGloggan, which is a leader in the field. We had some extensive uh, discussion, preliminary discussion on uh, whether we might institute an incentive bonus program, what that might look like, how it might be described and communicated to the city and other stakeholders. Uh, so suffice it to say, there'll be more on this uh, in the future. I don't know if uh, Trustee Chandra has anything to add because uh, he was in attendance as well. No, that's, that's a great update. Okay. Um, agenda item seven, education and training. I think you all have a chance to review the Cortex report, uh, the Sackers Fall Conference, and uh, I think this is a new one for us, is the NCPERS Accredited Fiduciary Program. Mm -hmm. um, are there any proposed agenda items? Hearing none, this meeting stands in adjournment. Please stand by as we have our committee meetings following this meeting. Thank you all. We are.